Our next speaker is Saint Simon Lalancet. Um, Dr. Lalancet is cardiologist. Currently, he's conducting um, critical care ultrasound fellowship in your institution. Uh, I'm sure he's using full advantage of your mentorship. Uh, we'll start his pre recorded uh, lecture. I believe Dr. Lalancet will be available to answer questions at the end of our session. Thank you very much. Greetings, everyone. My name is Jean Smolanancet. I have completed my training in cardiology and I am currently a critical care fellow at the University of Montreal and the Montreal Art Institute. It is with great pleasure that I have accepted the invitation to discuss about perioperative and clinical role of liver transesophageal ultrasound, or more exactly, liver transgastric abdominal ultrasound. I don't have any conflict of interest for this talk. The main objective of this talk will be to review abnormal IVC, hepatic vein, and portal vein imaging using transgastric abdominal, abdominal ultrasound to understand the clinical significance of abnormal Doppler findings in the liver and to talk about the portal vein pulsatility index. Let's focus on IVC and hepatic veins. As Dr. Danu well explained in his presentation, IVC and hepatic veins view can be obtained from a trans transgastric view by rotating the probe to the patient's right. Around zero degree, the IVC can be seen in short axis along with the three hepatic veins. Around 90 degrees, a long axis of the IVC can be obtained with one of the hepatic veins. IVC and hepatic veins TGAS examination can be useful in many ways. Diagnosis of right ventricular systolic and diastolic dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension, assessment for IVC stenosis or obstruction in liver transplantation, heart transplantation, ECMO and artificial heart, ruling, ruling out abdominal IVC tumor or thrombus, when an abdominal compartment syndrome is suspected, or intraoperative monitoring during renal cell carcinoma surgery involving the IVC. Looking at the size of the IVC and the hepatic vein flow may identify the mechanism of hemodynamic instability. The presence of a reduced mean systemic venous pressure, secondary to hypovolemia or a pure vasodilatatory shock, IVC will often be small and the hepatic vein flow will be normal or increased. If there is increased resistance to venous return, the IVC will be distended if the obstruction is located at the junction of the IVC and right atrium or collapse if it is secondary to an, an abdominal compartment syndrome. However, in both cases, hepatic vein flow will be abnormal with greatly reduced velocities or even no flow. Finally, in the context of a cardiogenic etiology, IVC will be dilated. Hepatic vein flow will be abnormal with reduced systolic to diastolic ratio and permanent atrial reversal velocity. Now let's see how it can be useful with real cases. Here is a 37 years old man who had a Fontan procedure for congenital heart disease. He became unstable after weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass. A view from the IVC was obtained before and after a correction. A pulse wave doppler of the hepatic vein was mostly normal before cardiopulmonary bypass but velocities were greatly reduced after. This finding in combination with a dilated IVC is compatible with the IVC stenosis post fontan procedure. The possibility of an IVC obstruction or stenosis should always be verified after a procedure involving manipulation of the IVC. In brief, a shock state with a dilated IVC and increased increase resistance to venous return can result from an extrinsic process such as tamponade, with RV and a right atrium collapse, abdominal compartment syndrome when you have collapse IVC and the free fluid, or from an intrinsic process. Think about it in any surgical procedure where the IVC has been manipulated. This is an example of a nitrogenic IVC stenosis. Note the reduction of flow before and after the correction. Here is another case. 
After a most complicated cardiac surgery, a 42 years old developed a refractory shock on post op D3 in the ICU with tachycardia, acidosis, hypoxemia, and increased abdominal pressure. As we can see, the IVC is collapsed on the echography. On the CD scan performed on an other patient, extended mesenteric ischemia with partial venous gas is present with second secondary compression of both the IVC and aorta, causing an abnormal compartment syndrome. In the yellow circle, we can see that both the aorta and IVC are barely visible because of the massive compression in this case. IVC imaging can also be useful to identify thrombus, especially in at risk population. Here is a large mobile cloud seen on surface echography on a patient recently decandidated from ECMO. Up to 46% of patients develop venous thromboembolic complication during or after ECMO therapy. It is important to recognize these complications as they can be devastating. Now let's go back to medical school with a review of the central venous waveform and how it translates on the hepatic vent flow. First, we use the EKG to localize systole and diastole. The atrial contraction happens shortly after the P wave and corresponds to the A wave of the right atrial pressure waveform. The same A wave appears on the hepatic vent flow. The X descent secondary to atrial relaxation is located in systole and corresponds to the S wave on the hepatic vent flow. The venous return at the end of systole raises the atrial pressure, giving the A wave on both the uh, right atrial pressure waveform and the hepatic vent flow. Finally, the Wide descent secondary to tricuspid valve opening is located during the diastole. The T wave is the hepatic vent flow equivalent. In case of increasing right atrial pressure, the X wave will become blunted and the same thing will happen to the S wave on the hepatic vent flow. The V wave may become more permanent too. As RV function deteriorates, note the progressive disappearance of the X descent and the S wave with a predominant V wave. The hepatic veins offer a favorable angle for Doppler interrogation, as you can see on picture A, and are located really close to the IVC and right atrium, as you can see uh, during a surgical pr procedure on picture D. Consequently, it is a good place to evaluate the venous filling of the right ventricle. Here on picture C, the Doppler tracing illustrates an abnormal SD ratio inferior to one compatible with a mild RV dysfunction. This case demonstrates how we can integrate all this information. This 73 year old woman with heart failure secondary to mitral and tricuspid regurgitation was referred for mitral valve replacement and tricuspid valve replacement. On the, tip, on the top left corner, the stomach appears severely taken on t secondary to venous congestion. On the monitor, pulmonary hypertension is present, as you can see on the yellow pulmonary artery curve. The central, the central venous pressure is also elevated with permanent V weight visible on the green curve. On the mid esophageal four chamber view, both atrium are dilated and RV dysfunction is present with an RV free wall strain of minus 15.7%. Accordingly, the hepatic vein Doppler is compatible with the severe TR and RV dysfunction as the S wave is completely reversed. The IVC and the hepatic vent flow can also evolve as complications occur or therapeutic measures are taken and can be monitored during the case. This case of a 77-year-old man of pond cabbage is a great example. After the induction, the patient was stable on norepinephrine and hepatic vent doppler was normal with S on D ratio over 1. During the procedure, the patient was hypotensive and required high dose of norepinephrine. The hepatic vein doppler show S wave inversion compatible with severe RV dysfunction and the patient was successfully treated with inotrope. Interestingly, at the end of surgery, the IVC, visible on bottom right, started to collapse with increased hepatic flow velocity. The last doppler signal was associated with vasodilatation because there were no blood losses. A severe vasoplasia secondary to the procedure was diagnosed and treated with vasopressor. This case emphasizes the importance to reassess the situation and echographic data when a patient becomes unstable.
Now let's talk about the portal vein. Starting from the IVC view, the right portal vein can often be viewed by, with an angle between 50 to 70 degrees and minor manipulation. The portal vein can be identified by its echo dance sheet and a typical laminar or monophasic velocity between 15 and 30 centimeter per second. Portal vein imaging has many applications. We can use it for monitoring right ventricular dysfunction associated with venous congestion, evaluation of response to medical treatment, abdominal compartment syndrome, mesenteric ischemia with portal venous air, hepatic artery and portal vein stenosis in liver transplantation. In this presentation, we will mainly focus on the two first points. Previously, we talked about the manifestation of RV failure on right atrial pressure curve. We also talked about the equivalent on hepatic vent Doppler with S blunting then reversal as the RV dysfunction progresses. As the venous congestion secondary to RV dysfunction, dysfunction appear, the portal Doppler will become more and more pulsatile. I will not address the hepatic Doppler in this talk as Dr. Bobien Sweeney, who is an expert, will talk about it better than me in the next presentation. With the portal Doppler tracing, we can calculate the portal ventral sensitivity or PVPI. The PVPI is the ratio of the difference between maximum velocity and minimum velocity on the maximum velocity. Now let's see how these notions correlate into practice. This is a 34-year-old woman post cardiopulmonary bypass after a ROS procedure. On the top corner, there are giant V waves on the CVP curve. Those giant V-waves are also seen on the hepatic vein Doppler associated with S blunting. The portal Doppler show abnormal pulsatility. Associated also with a giant V-wave. These hemodynamic and echographic findings are compatible with significant RV dysfunction and venous congestion and should be addressed. This other case of a 76-year-old woman post-cabbagian mitral valve replacement is a great example of how we can integrate echographic data to other clinical information. Even if the central venous pressure, the pulmonary arterial pressure, and the RV function were normal before the cardiopulmonary bypass, she developed RV dysfunction with elevated diastolic RV pressure, abnormal portal Doppler, and abnormal venous Doppler, hepatic vein Doppler, sorry. The transcranial Doppler signal indicates the presence of several high intensity transient signals compatible with air emboli. Air is also embolized in the uh, right coronary artery and led to post op RV failure, which was treated with inotropic support. It is interesting to visualize the RV dysfunction and its consequences with echography. However, it is also useful to use the echography to monitor the response to different interventions. As you can see in this case of a 22-year-old woman with a North May 3 left ventricular assist device implantation. Before the procedure, she had pulmonary hypertension, elevated central venous pressure, and severe reventricular dysfunction. The portal Doppler is also markedly abnormal with severe venous congestion. The procedure was performed by Dr. Lamarche at the Montreal Art Institute. She was treated two times with inhalated vasodilators, namely mirinone and epoprostenol. This medication helped with pulmonary pressure without major effect on systemic pressure, as you can see on the left graph. The portal pulsatility was also reduced. After the procedure, normal flow was restored in the portal vein. Blood, loss, blood losses were min, minor. She was weaned with epinephrine and NO. Fluid balance was very negative with minus 3.4 letters with the help of hemofiltration and LASIX. Consequently, she was extubated two hours post op in the ICU in a stable condition. 
The prognostic value of port of impulse satellite has been studied by Dr. Dono and his team. In this article that includes 150 cardiac surgical patients and published in the British Journal of Anesthesia in 2019, they observed that abnormal portal or splenic vein pulsatility indicated RV dysfunction and predicts post-op complication. In fact, for predicting uh, post-op major complication, namely acute kidney injury, significant bleeding, surgical reintervention, and death, after multivariable analysis, portal flow pulsatility after uh, cardiopulmonary bypass was the best predictor with a node ratio of 5.13. It was better than systolic RV dysfunction. A subsequent multicenter prospective score study led by Dr. Dono was also published in the British Journal of Anesthesia in 2022. The association between portal Doppler pulsatility before and after cardiopulmonary bypass were assessed on 373 cardiac surgery patients. The outcomes were time on life support after surgery and major complications after surgery, major bleeding, reintervention, severe acute kidney injury, delirium, death, and prolonged mechanical ventilation. In this study, the presence of a portal pulsatility fraction over 50% or PPF50 before or after cardiopulmonary bypass was associated with a longer duration of life support. The presence of a PPF50 after cardiopulmonary bypass was also associated with a significantly higher rate of major complication, 36.4% versus 20.3%. In conclusion, TGALS can maximize the potential of TEE without additional costs. It can be a great tool for unstable patient, especially when the art is normal. Portal hypertension is highly pronostic before and after cardiac surgery. And TGALS represents a new area of research in perioperative anesthesia and critical care. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks to the symposium organization for the invitation. Don't hesitate to communicate with me if you have any question. And a special thanks to Dr. Dono, who is a great mentor, an exceptional clinician and researcher, researcher, but mostly one of the kindest and most passionate colleagues. Thank you everyone. Jean Simon, uh, thank you so much for excellent lecture. Uh, I'm sure it will provoke even more discussion 